Thank you, Aaron. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made, and I'm glad to be here in it with you. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share my thoughts and perspective after having served St. Matthew as the Church Council President this last year. I am honored to follow in the footsteps of many incredible women and men that have come before me in the same position, and many past presidents are people I consider as personal models of faithful church service. Over the years, I've witnessed past presidents put their experience into a soundtrack of songs representing their term. I've heard them tell moving stories of their personal journeys, provide deep spiritual guidance. Selfies have been taken, although I don't see Rob here today, he took a selfie. Dreams for St. Matthew have been described, top 10 lists have been written, and people have been asked to pony up. Today, I'm gonna to start off with a nursery rhyme, and it's one I know you all know, but it does take some audience participation, so here we go. Everybody, put your hands like this. <laughs> know this one? Here is the church, here is the steeple, open the doors, and see all the people. Thank you. So the reason I kick off my sermon this way is because this is the thought that came to my mind when I was asked to join council three years ago, and then when I was considered becoming the church council president. It's been, in fact, the people of St. Matthew that have been my inspiration over the last three years. If you remember back to late 2019, you would recall, Pastor Allen was seated as our experienced senior pastor. Miss Susan was leading our active children's program, and we didn't even know how to spell COVID. How hard could it be, I thought. <laughs> well, what has happened over the past three years have been change and challenge both for our church and for our world. And what I have observed is that the DNA of St. Matthew, the people of St. Matthew have held strong. As you know, DNA is the genetic information inside of cells of the body that makes people who they are. It's the instruction set of how to build a person, like the blueprints for a house. It's a chemical diary of human history that's passed down from generation to generation. The DNA of St. Matthew is contained in our people, those that are here today and those that have come before us. Through all the change we have faced over the last three years, our St. Matthew DNA has held strong. Like the nursery rhyme, I've opened up the doors and I've seen the people, all of you. And what I have seen is that we focus on doing God's work for each other and with each other. We strive to be followers of Jesus. We share in each other's joys. We extend comfort during times of difficulty and we have fun together along the way. Like the scripture we heard today, we've described ourselves as, we've devoted ourselves to fellowship, to breaking of bread, to praying, and we've done so with glad and generous hearts. That's our DNA. Since I've often been coached that in public speaking, it's a good idea to talk about what you know. My time today, I'm gonna to share a little bit about myself. I'm gonna talk some about my day job, and then give you my view on the overall state of St. Matthew. So I'll start the part about myself with a confession, and that is that change is not my preferred state. In fact, I don't like it, I actively avoid it, and it makes me uncomfortable. So I'm gonna give you a few proof points uh, to support this fact. I was raised in St. Matthew United Church of Christ in Barrington, the town I grew up in. My German grandparents attended the same church, and my grandma was especially active at St. Paul, spending many hours cooking in the church kitchen. And I have a picture here of her in 1963 um, from the St. Matthew Bulletin um, with the Women's Guild. My parents bought the same house my dad grew up in, in Barrington, from my grandparents shortly after I was born. And as a family growing up, we were regular attendees at St. Paul. And both of my parents were very active in the church. My brother and I were both confirmed at St. Paul, and it was also the church I was married in. My husband, Brian, also grew up in Barrington as well, and we started dating when I was 15. Brian's one of 13 children, so you might guess he was not raised in the United Church of Christ. <laughs> um, but shortly after getting married in 1987, we moved to Wheaton, and we were looking for a shared church experience. We found St. Matthew, we were greeted warmly at the door and took the stairs up to the old sanctuary, 
and we found our church family here ever since. We raised our two children, Emily and Michael, who are now 29 and 26. Emily's here today, thank you. Um, they were both uh, baptized here. They attended St. Matthew Prairie Path Preschool. They were both confirmed here. And I've lived my entire life in Illinois. I went to college at the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, the same school that my parents attended and where they met. I had the same major of ceramic engineering as my father, so he and I actually had some of the same teachers, both in high school and in college. My one brother went to the University of Illinois, and completely of their own choosing, both of our children are Illini as well. I have a picture here that we took when my son graduated um, of all of us showing off our, our school spirit. After college, I went to work for IBM here in Chicago. I attended a graduate school at Northwestern, and while IBM in the day was termed I've been moved, I never moved. Instead, I've had the same position of computer sales since 1987. So just to recap, I grew up in the same town my father was born in. I've never lived outside of Illinois. I've been married to the person I started dating when I was 15, and I've basically had the same job for 35 years. <laughs> and I've attended a UCC church my whole life. So as I said, change does not come easy for me. But the reality of life is that change happens, whether we like it or not. And when inevitably, inevitably faced with change, the best thing we can do is respond in a way that's true to who we are, to be guided by our DNA. While I've described my natural aversion to change, I did choose to be in the technology industry, which has gone through massive transformations in the last decades. My career has been in selling computers to companies to run their data centers. The kind of computers I spend my days focused on are the ones in big rooms with rows and rows of machines the size of refrigerators that have blinking lights, that are climate controlled, and have secure access. That's the kind I'm talking about. So the next slide here. In fact, here's a picture of one of those data centers <laughs> that won my company the award for the most beautiful data center in the world. <laughs> it's housed in a former, former chapel in Spain, so it does have a beautiful setting. Now, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but us computer nerds t need to make things up to give out awards for, so there you go. <laughs> the kinds of computers running here are the ones behind everything from processing your credit card purchase to showing you what your, celeb your favorite celebrities are up to on Instagram. When I first started my job, I spent 18 months in training learning how a computer works. And while technology has changed dramatically over the years, the core components of a computer are the same as when they were invented. There's a processor, which is the brains behind doing the computation. In technology, this component's gotten much smaller, it's gotten much faster, it's learned to do many things at once, but it's basically remained the same. Another key com part of the computer is the storage, or the electronic file cabinet that holds data. These storage devices have progressed from expensive spinning disks of metal to floppy disks, to CDs, to the flash drives you're all familiar with today. In fact, back in 1980, a one gigabyte storage device was introduced and it weighed 550 pounds. And I now have 250 times that on my phone. So you have the system, uh, the brains behind the computer, the data, but you need some instruction manuals, and that's the computer program. If you're of a certain age, myself included, you may have written computer programs on punch cards at one time. And this same logic has advanced to the point where programs run massive volumes of calculations to do things like map the human genome, predict the weather, and they're even building artificial intelligence that lets you drive a car for you and make sure you're endlessly haunted by that one item you looked at once when you were browsing around Amazon. <laughs> And all of this technology has to be connected to be beneficial. So we've gone from physically connecting computers and rooms with cords to phone lines, dial-up phone lines in our home, to now high-speed internet into our homes. And today, really all we do is tap a few buttons on our phone and we literally communicate through thin air. So I take you down this history path of technology to underscore the point that while there have been massive and truly mind-blowing advances in computers, the building blocks have remained exactly the same. Everything seems new, and it feels different, and it can be overwhelming, but the computer DNA is unchanged. Oh, next slide. And so it is with the church today. 
While St. Matthew has had an especially high amount of change related to our staff in the last year, the challenges we face are not unique. Even before COVID, church attendance has been on the decline. Only 28% of Americans attend a religious service at least once a month, and about a quarter of the U.S. population considers themselves spiritual but not religious. And expressing that spirituality usually, usually does not involve attending a church. When we think about what the future of the church holds and what it looks like, the game has changed. I read a recent article uh, that included a quote from a Tennessee pastor named Chris Battle, who said that the way he used to measure church success was called the BPs, butts in the pews, bucks in the plate, baptisms, baptisms in the pool, and building programs. And he's right. These are the traditional ways success has been measured in many churches, ours included. And while these measurements will continue to be important, our thinking needs to expand. The landscape around us has changed, and we must decide how we will transform with it. What role will St. Matthew play? Well, I don't have a crystal ball to predict what the, what the church of the future will look like, but what I do have is a view of how St. Matthew is doing so far, and in my admittedly biased opinion, we are responding well. We have much to be excited about. And I say that because we've reacted to change in ways that are true to who we are. We, the people of this church, are here because we care about this place, we care about each other, and we want to share our resources and energy to further God's work in Wheaton. We do not ignore or shy away from talking about messy or even controversial topics in today's society and how um, topics many churches avoid. We strive to understand these in the context of our faith and how as followers of Jesus, we are called to respond. When faced with a change in leadership, this past year we celebrated our time with Pastor Allen. We warmly welcome Pastor Kyle and thanks to the great work of our search committee, we excitedly welcome Pastor Aaron. In addition to being the first female settled pastor here at St. Matthew, Aaron has brought to us a new perspective. It's been refreshing and intriguing for me personally to hear Aaron's take on the role of the church in today's world, and her sermons have broadened my thinking to consider biblical stories and church traditions in a new light. And Erin, occasionally along with her cats, if you're not aware, is expanding our reach by embracing tools like social media and other new and personal approaches we'll need to rely upon to share our message. Pastor Erin is going to challenge us, and I think we will challenge her, but all in wonderful and healthy and needed ways because we will do it with mutual love and respect, because that's who we are. It's in our DNA. Are we a perfect church? No. Were we impacted by the pandemic and slower than we would have wanted return to people worshiping in person? Yes. Will we need to per put forth an effort to grow our membership? Yes. But our extravagant and genuine welcome will continue to be extended to all who touch St. Matthew and that will serve us well. Change is constant, change is difficult, but as a former CEO of my employer said, growth and comfort do not coexist. Things are gonna feel uncomfortable for a bit. How we define and measure the success of St. Matthew is gonna shift. Our church leaders will be faced with challenging decisions. But what will not change is the spirit of this place. What will not change is the St. Matthew DNA. Just like the world of computers and technology, so very much has changed, but the core of what's inside St. Matthew, all the people, has not changed. I'll close that uh, by sharing that in looking back for some inspiration for my uh, annual report letter and for this sermon, I was reminded of a poem Don Schubert uh, included in her president's report in 2014. It was a poem written in 1961 by St. Matthew's founding pastor, Harold Dobstaff. And as I read this poem, it struck me that although it was written before I was born, before St. Matthew had a physical building, the words beautifully describe who we are still today. So here it is. 
My dream for St. Matthew United Church of Christ is concerned with more than brick and stone and wood and mortar. Even though it is true, we all look forward to that day when we will have a building of our own. My dream concerns the spirit that will ever live within this church. Thus, my dream is that this church may ever be a church adequate for ministering to every person that seeks its services. A church with a warm heart, ever willing to give itself for the sake of others. A church with an open mind, always willing to listen and respect other people's thoughts and opinions, no matter how different they may seem from our own. A church that cares for the least and the last, that heals hurt lives, that comforts the aged, challenges the young, revives the weary, and continually speaks the good news of God's forgiveness, love, and mercy. A church that knows no division of race or class or nationality, that builds no walls economically, socially, or politically, a church with an open door and an open membership to all people. A church that looks forward as well as backward. A church as high as the ideals of Jesus, as broad as the earth's surface, and as low as the humblest human. A church that is not afraid to work for and witness to its faith. A church that is always willing to come together for periods of worship and prayer. A church that inspires courage for this life and hope for the life to come. A church in which all people may find Christ. A church of the living God. This is my dream for this church. I pray it might become your dream. My fellow St. Matthew family members, we have lived up to this dream. And I am confident and excited and comforted in my faith that we will continue to do so. It's in our DNA. It's who we are. Thank you.